Okay, hello everybody. I'm Brian and this is Amy News and Conversation. We're here at day three of Amy Exchange in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, I'm here today with Dr. Eamon Hoxie. He's the uh, recipient of the Amy Foundation Loffman Great Batch Award, which is Amy's most prestigious award. This is an award that really recognizes a full career that's had an impact both on Amy, the standards world, uh, health technology in general. So, Eamon, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us uh, who you are and what you do. Uh, hi. Uh, well, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for the uh, opportunity to uh, join you and have a, have a chat today. Uh, as you said, uh, my, uh, I'm at the point in my career where, where I'm trying to turn everything in my CV to X, former, past, <laughs> previous or um, uh, anything related to the, to the past. So yeah, I'm definitely at the stage where um, uh, I get asked to talk. When I get asked to talk, I'm asked to talk about the past and how we got here rather than where we're going. So uh, I'm sure we can, we can, we can focus on that. Um, I started my career as a pharmacist. I qualified as a pharmacist in the, um, in the UK. Uh, and did a year working in a hospital pharmacy in order to get my uh, professional qualifications. Uh, then went back to university to do a PhD, uh, which was on microbial inactivation, uh, which led me into the, the, the uh, 45 years of interest in killing microorganisms and sterilization processes in, in general. Uh, so having qualified uh, with a PhD, I moved to work for the United Kingdom Department of Health, um, which um, the part of that organization which eventually became the Medical Devices Agency and then was incorporated to create the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, so the UK equivalent of the, uh, uh, of the FDA. And I started there um, uh, using my PhD, so looking at sterilization processes in hospital and, and industry, um, then kind of gradually expanded from that um, to look at uh, quality management, quality management systems. Um, then we was involved in introducing device regulation at a European perspective. Um, and uh, kind of went from there. Uh, I mean, you're mentioning a lot of buzzwords. We've yeah. got you know, device regulation, yeah. quality management, uh, obviously sterilization, all of these, when I think about it, that says standards. Yeah. When did you start getting involved in the standards process, standards development process? So I was sent by the Department of Health to a, a standards committee um, pretty soon after I joined, so 1984. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I went to my first British Standards Committee, so that was preparing uh, standards for sterilizers um, as a, a UK uh, standard because everything, the, the, it was before the explosion that we've seen in uh, international standardization and, and um, national organizations were, were in, the, in the main uh, producing national standards. Was this with BSI? This was with BSI, okay, yeah, uh, and uh, the British Standards Institution in the in the UK. Um, and a little anecdote: I went to uh, uh, shortly after that. The, the UK had, uh, well, Europe had just started writing a standard for large sterilizers uh, at that point, and. Um, the following year in 85, I was sent to, to my, uh, very memorably for me, to, to my first European standards meeting. Um, and I, I, I have a little uh, recollection of that meeting but that, that uh, I think will uh, surprise some people. So what my f first recollection of the meeting was you could not see across the room for cigarette smoke. <laughs> Uh, it just, just shows you how long ago that was. Uh, the second was... Um, everybody participating was male, 100% mm. male uh, participation. And the third thing I can remember, I didn't have a clue what was going on at any point. It was, it was sort of random, um, very, very difficult to follow, very opaque as to what the, uh, the process was or even what we were trying to achieve. This is highly technical, too much jargon. I mean, uh, you're coming at it with a PhD. Jargon yeah, shouldn't be a problem. Uh, well, it, I think it was a lack of, lack of clarity on the goal. And mm. um, what was certainly clear was that there wasn't, a, there wasn't a process to reach consensus. So everybody had a view and they'd throw it in, but there was no way to then um, 
work something to produce agreement or alignment as to as to what was what was trying to achieve so you know fortunately i think in the in the, the 30 years since uh, since then at least two of those things have have dramatically improved in terms of standardization i still often don't have a clue what's going on but um <laughs> I, th I think one the the removal of cigarette smoke and a much better diversity of participation we can uh, i think we'd all recognize today I mean, maybe if we see our faces each is looking in each other's eyes through the cigarette smoke a little bit more we reach a consensus right <laughs> yeah those consensus based standards yeah. now well I, the interesting thing i always found when i talk to folks who are heavily involved in the the standardization development world is that there is this deep sense of community right a lot of people are saying oh you know we can have some phone calls and Zoom calls, et cetera, but I love seeing my friends. And that's interesting to me because this is a room full of people. They might be representing competing companies or it might be a manufacturer and a regulator. They might not see eye to eye on certain policies and yet they come into this room and suddenly everybody's friendly with one another. Is that, was that always the case? Is there ever not that? Um, I mean, I don't think there's ever... I don't think I'd ever say there was there was animosity, but I think um, to me, as the objectives become clearer and the um, the process becomes clearer, it becomes easier to um, uh, to to, to uh, get to a point where you, you you know you are looking for consensus. I mean, I think the you know the the thing, the one thing that I've kind of learn I guess is is and the one of the things that I take away from it is the importance of those interpersonal skills mm -hmm. you know you kind of think it's a technical thing and we you know we're going to agree whether the tolerance should be 0 0.001 or 0 0.0011 but actually it's it's about the discussion and understanding the different points of view I think you've got to I always think that you've got to recognize that everybody comes at this with a different perspective and the value come, and there's a there's a nugget in everybody's perspective because they've got a different set of experiences and they've they've come across things in a different way. So if you can recognise that there's value in that perspective and try and look at it from their perspective, and if you like internalise it or or get that, then you will get a better standard because you can put all of those nuggets together, and you get something that's valuable. Uh, uh, where the, the individual pieces aren't. If you can put it in a coherent, organized manner, then, you, then you've then you got something, and you've got something that's really valuable. And it needs the interpersonal skills to, to, to do that, because you know, not everybody's the same, not everybody can express themselves in, in the same way. You know, we have a huge advantage in that we mostly speak a common language between the US and, 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 uh, the, UK. Uh, and the UK. Not entirely, but, but mostly, you know, <laughs> uh, but mostly, mostly a common language. I don't language. know if I'll ever agree on beans on toast, but, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that. cultural differences, <laughs> but, you know, that's, uh, um, yeah, I'm not sure about macaroni cheese on a beef, on a hamburger either, but, you know, that we, we can, you know, we can differ on those things, but we understand each other what we're, that we're talking about. But there are amazing people coming who are not in their first language. They're often not even in their second language. They oh, wow. might be working in their third language. And they're trying to convey often something that's quite difficult. So you've, I think you've got to be prepared to be patient and to think, try and get to understand where they're coming from and that perspective. And then you get value from the, the process. I'm curious if there were any moments when you were involved in almost too many standards committees to count at this yeah. point, but that you're particularly proud of, like a, a specific challenge or a specific, specific moment, you oh, we got past that, we got through that, and we succeeded. Uh, I, I think, I think if, if I think back, and I, as you say, I've, I've participated in a, in a lot of standards across, uh, across quite, quite a range. Some, of, some things that I knew quite a lot about, and some things when I started I didn't really know very much about, but just going through the process, you, you kind of get together. But I think what I most both enjoyed and I'm proud of is um, the standards where we we put down the fundamental of the process the, or the fundamentals of something, the, the general requirements, the things that apply 
overall. So um, the first, um, I, I was lucky enough to, 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 I think the first international standard group I convened um, was to, to, to put together the general requirements for sterile, for validating, developing, validating and controlling a sterilization process. And what I always used to start was, you, you know, every meeting we'd kind of go off and, and get into some detail. I'd say, you need to remember this could be some magic death ray that we don't know what it is at the moment. So what do I need to do to prove that it's a sterilizing process, to develop the specific set of conditions that I need to, to generate the outcome I want, to validate that that's effective and reproducible, and then to show that I can do it on a routine basis day after day after day yeah. and deliver to it. Build to build a strict foundation. foundation. So that, yeah. that set um, a, a kind of systematic way of, of, go, of going through that process. And that was, you know, that was adopted by, by a standard. It's been revised, uh, confirmed met a number of times since then. It's, it's been revised, but the revisions have been really quite minor since. So the fact that we did that in the early 1990s and in 2020, it's fundamentally still, still accepted going yeah. and is the, the structure of that has become the format that every single one of the sterilization standards has, has followed. And they've been able to say, well, if it's radiation or ethylene oxide or heat or magic process number one that we haven't developed yet, you can still conceptually go through the same set of steps. There'll be different things you need to measure and, and, and different details, but actually the fundamentals are the same. And many people use more than one process. So having a set way of laying out the standard means that if you've worked with two different processes, you've basically got common terminology, you've got a common approach. So you can say, oh yeah, I have to do this differently because I'm measuring temperature, not radiation dose. But actually I'm trying to achieve the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing. And I, I wanted to make sure that we knew which standard we're talking about here. Um, do you remember the alphanumeric designation? 14937. This is an ISO standard. ISO, yeah. Okay. So it's, a, it's, also, it's an Amy ANSI ISO. It's a E E N B S ISO. So it's a, yeah, it's a, all of those things. So it's been adopted internationally, yeah. This is a foundational standard, yeah. absolutely. We'll put a link in the description for anyone who was curious about it that didn't know already. Um, and Now, we've been talking about the past and, and your career and standards, great, but you did mention at the start of the talk that, oh, people come to me to talk about the past, not the future. I still want to know your take on the future. You know, you've been here at Amy Exchange. Uh, I, I hope you got to catch some of the sterilization sessions in particular. Um, is there any movement in the field that you think we should keep an eye on, or, oh, this is interesting. Something's changing here. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think from a, a sterilization perspective, um, the environmental issues around ethylene oxide, particularly here in the US, are, uh, are interesting. Mm -hmm. and I, th I know it would be interesting to see how, how that develops. Again, I'm, I'm going to change tack on you a little bit by going back a bit into the past. But uh, in the 80s, when I started um, there was a big thought that ethylene oxide was going to be replaced because uh, chlorofluorocarbons were being phased out because of the Montreal Protocol and the environmental effects. And most processes were ethylene oxide mixed with CFCs. I see. And there was, um, they had to be removed. So there was international agreement that they were going to, and people thought, oh, we're, gonna, we're not going to use ethylene oxide. Mm. And yet we still ended up with roughly 50% of single-use medical devices 30 right, years later yeah. are still using EO. Um, so I find it difficult to think that there's a magic solution that's going to replace it just, just like that. But right. there's, th there will be lots of um, ways, and I think there are lots of, potentially lots of ways of reducing the amount of ethylene oxide that's used in processes. Most ethylene oxide processes are very conservative. Um, and there's ways that the amounts could be changed and reduced. Um, some things can move off into other other processes. So I think how that changes will be uh, will be interesting, which I shall watch from my fireside with a large glass of wine. <laughs> the perks of retirement. Yeah. 
<laughs> no, that's fantastic. Well, Eamon, thank you so much again for joining me and talking about this today and providing your insights. I hope those who are thinking about getting involved in standards or thinking about uh, the field in general have learned a little bit from this. And uh, congratulations on winning the Lofman Great Batch Award. Thank you very much. A pleasure for, for, and thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely.